she saw him leave that morning, but he didn't come back that afternoon. He didn't show up that night. Nobody heard from him. The teen's body was found in a rolled up gym mat in a high school in 2013. His death ruled accidental. Say my name and remember what you've done. Your hurricane has blackened out the sun. You can't continue to kill unarmed black people and get away with it. But if Kendrick did die of an accident, how, with all that distrust, how could you even ever show that? But then on the flip side, is they didn't treat it like it, it could have been a homicide. Lowndes County Sheriff Ashley Polk announced officials were reopening the investigation. Only angle is to find justice for my son. You can just tell death had come through our family and it just settled. So I don't know about you, but this case is extremely overwhelming to me. I mean, when we went back through all the news clips and all the things that happened, I almost thought like, where the hell do we start? Did you feel like that at all? Yeah, there's just so much that has happened uh, in the past eight years. I really feel like we need to go back to the beginning. Yeah, I think that's the only, I think we really have to just reverse ourselves, start back at the beginning and then move forward from that so that we can try to pick through what happened to Kendrick in an appropriate way. Agreed. The Lowndes County Sheriff says his office has received new information in the death investigation of Kendrick Johnson. Now he says authorities have an audio recording of someone admitting to Johnson's death. The Lowndes County Sheriff has reopened the investigation into the death of Kendrick Johnson. A third autopsy now reveals that Kendrick Johnson died from non-accidental injuries. New developments in the Kendrick Johnson death investigation. We have uncovered an email whose sender claims to know who killed Johnson. I am of the opinion that a sufficient basis exists for my office to conduct a formal review of the facts and investigation surrounding the death of Kendrick Johnson. When we got the body uh, for the second autopsy, that organs, the heart, lungs, liver, etc., we're not with the body. The Johnsons hired Dr. Bill Anderson to conduct an independent second autopsy. The death of a Lowndes High School student, Kendrick Johnson, has now officially been ruled an accident. Lowndes County Sheriff's officials jumped into action this morning after a student's body was found on the Lowndes High School campus. All right, so what we're in Valdosta and we've been doing some research on Kendrick's case and we, I know we wanted to call the police force just to see if they're willing to interview with us. Sheriff's office. Um, yes, can I please speak to Sheriff Polk? He is here, but I believe he's in a meeting. May I take a message for him? Yeah, thank you so much. So one of the things I think that's really important to all the cases that we do is we really want the family's approval for us moving forward with the case because we don't want to get in the way or harm the case at all. So that's one of the groups we initially started reaching out to was the family and it sounds like Lydia is going to speak on behalf of them. That's great. We need someone from what I've seen after all my research and everything. She seems to be like one of the main uh, spokespeople for the family besides Marcus Coleman. Yeah, and she's Jackie's sister and has known Kendrick since he was seven. So I really think that she's gonna be a really nice person to speak to and can really fill us in on some details about who Kendrick was and maybe up to what happened and what they've been doing since. Okay. Instructions in English. Press one. If you don't have a touch tone phone, 
Please stay on the line to leave a voice message. Hi, Lydia. My name is Ash Patino, and I'm doing a documentary series on Kendrick Johnson, and I was hoping to talk to you. We're actually in town. We really would like to hopefully interview a family member about who KJ was. Anyways, um, just give me a call back, and we can talk further. Thanks so much. So some good news. Lydia called back. She seems very excited to talk to us about Kendrick and what potentially happened to him. So we're going to be interviewing with her, so I'm pretty excited about that. That's exciting. You said you originally met Kendrick when he was seven. About seven years old. Do you remember when you first met he him? He was real quiet. Was he? he was real, real quiet. He always been like, if he don't know you outside of his family and his friends, you know, his cousins, anything or anybody outside, he's real quiet. The most popular kid, but the quietest one. And that's how he was when I first met him. But then, you know, <laughs> Jackie would blame. She was like, you got my children acting a fool. So just really to clarify here, Jackie is KJ's mom. And it's really nice to hear Lydia talk about their relationship and kind of the process of what Jackie's had to deal with moving forward on some of this stuff. When I first met all of them, we have the same father, me and Jackie, different moms. So we didn't really know each other growing up. But it felt like when I first met her and, and the kids, it felt like we've been knowing each other our whole lives and we've been like this ever since. But he was so quiet, him and Kenyatta, and then I would, with my playful self, just joke around and make jokes or whatnot and brought him out of shell with me. Yeah. Now with his family, he, he was already like that, but with me, he had to you know, grow to. And it didn't take long. It didn't take long at all. Joking and laughing and cutting up and like slick, you know, roasting each other. We laughed so hard about that. Kendrick, he was, a, he was so much fun to be around. But then when you got on his bad side, that was it. Really? He just kind of was like, I'm done with you. Yeah, he, he, he get quiet. Yeah. He get quiet. He just, he was, a, he was that type of person. He never started nothing with nobody. He never initiated or engaged in any type of physical altercation unless you touch him first. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. Mm -hmm. Other than that, he was a lot of fun to be around. But I can tell, the last time I, I got a picture of my sister before all this happened with Kendrick, like a couple of weeks, December 8, 2012. I got, a one, I got one picture of Jackie and you can see so much life in her smile. After that, it was just like you can see something has been taken. Her smile just don't look the same. Yeah. Her, her smile just don't seem the same. It don't feel the same. I, have, I still had a picture she and I took together. I compared that picture from here and I compared it to every picture she and I have taken together and it don't look like the same jacket that I was with in December before this happened to yeah. Kendrick. And, and you, can, you can see, cause you know, you've been around this person so long and then when somebody takes something from them, it's just like life just left. Well, especially when there's not resolution and then you have to instead of grieving and being able to do that properly you have to fight and I think that takes away a huge portion which you need to kind of heal yeah. because instead of being able to do that you're just fighting and fighting. That's what they did. They, they jumped head first into it. Before the protesting and sitting on the corner and things like that. It wasn't awkward, it was just, you could tell, you can just tell death had come through our family. Yeah. And it just settled. You can just tell that, well, what we do now? So I guess let's look back for a moment to when we first went into Valdosta, because one thing I was so pleasantly surprised by is what a beautiful community it was. Oh yeah, and just driving through Valdosta and seeing like their college and their high schools, it seems like they take their sports really seriously. Just everything revolving that school is absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I think when we first started looking it up, it seems like the kind of the things that Valdosta is known for that come up a lot online are the school sports and then Mary Turner, which was a lynching that happened over 100 years ago, which hopefully we'll be able to get into a little. 
but those were actually kind of the main things, and then Kendrick Johnson. One thing I thought was amazing about the community is, you know, being from Jersey, I think the population's about 14% African American, but then you come into Valdosta and it feels more like 50%. I actually felt like the minority in some of the places that we've gone into since we've been in town, and I think that's really incredible uh, to see, just because it's not something I've seen a lot, just probably because I haven't been in the South as much. Ashley Street and Forest Street are both slave owners and plantation owners. I shouldn't just say they are not just plantation owners, they're also slave owners. So I also think that's kind of a message within the town. Now, granted, it was put up a long time ago. It's not like they just changed the names to the streets, but I still think that would be hard for me to be on Weinstein Street and Cosby Boulevard. I really wouldn't want that. So, or Lauer. <laughs> I mean, just thinking from a woman's perspective on this, Lower Avenue, I really wouldn't want to have to drive down those streets or see the big TV conglomerates who have been unethical to women on a building I had to walk into every day. I wouldn't really like that. I'm not saying we have to get rid of all the movies or take it away, but I, I just personally I don't want to see that on my courthouse steps. I want to make sure that justice is even. And to me, if you're already having something on your courthouse steps that is against your race or demographic in any way, I feel like that can be really hard to process. That would really send me a clear message of where justice would lie. I feel like you need to ask the African American population how they feel about those things before you assume that racism doesn't exist in Valdosta. Because right there, to me, that is a very prominent fixture that sends a clear message in my eyes. So I'm wondering if they would feel the same way. I feel like they would, because I would if I look at women's issues, issues that complete, that are really significant to me. I would be really frustrated by that. I feel like we should get a more prominent African-American figure's opinion on the racial divide within Valdosta, as well as how the community reacted when Kendrick died. Well, I think that's a great idea. And I think when we interview Eric Howard, who's a councilman there, we can talk to him about kind of what the impact has been on his community specifically, because he is African-American, so maybe he can give us some insight into the feelings we're having to see if those are actually based in reality. Oh, my name is Eric Howard. I'm a city councilman here in Valdosta, District 4. This year's coming up on my fourth year, so I actually be running for re-election. I got here by way of Moody. I was stationed at and Moody Air Force Base, and I decided to get out and make Valdosta my home. One thing I was surprised by is that there is such a, a heavy population of African Americans within Valdosta, and then you have, for instance, the Confederate Memorial at the courthouse or just some of the confederate flags I've seen. Do you think the African American community has like an opinion and does that bug it bug you guys or is, has it just been like it's there for so long and so prevalent that it's almost like part of everyday life? Now with me as far as the confederate flags and statues, why are we so happy to celebrate losing? I mean I, I've never understood that so if you want to continue to celebrate and let people know that you're losing, by all means go ahead. But you have so many people who say in this country is so patriotic, we're so patriotic, but these people fought against the union. But we're, we're eager to celebrate it because some people can't let go of that racial animus, that we should be superior to someone else. So that's, if that, that's, that's how they look at it. And I look at it, look at this second place, look at this loser. Second place is the first loser. So if you want to continue to celebrate that, by all means. Do you think that that has like an impact psychologically? It most definitely does. But like I said, you think about the older black people. You think about what they grew up with and what they, you know, when they see that flag, what does it mean to them? Versus the younger generation. There are some older people who you can't even, they don't even, some of them don't even like to talk about it because of what they've gone through. And then you have a group of people who don't even take that into consideration. They want to fly it with pride and hanging and fly it in their face. So now you have, a, like I said, an older generation who you don't have any respect for me at all because you won't do that. Then they wonder why there's distrust. And then as far as the younger black people, when they do their research and they see the history book and they're out here outspoken about the flag needs to come down. And so they bump heads with some of the other people who think it should be flown. And so that's when you have this divide. So there's, I mean, I, I, do I think it should be taken out? Yes, of course. But if you want to fly it, because you say this is the land of the 
free and home of the brave, you lost. I've never seen the losing team get the trophy. So I, that's why I say it has to be something more than that. Either there's something about this team that you don't want to let go and you're not willing to say it, but I'm not going to say it for you. I want you to say it. So no one can say, I put the words in your mouth. You go ahead and say, why you don't want to take that flag? Why you fly with so much pride yeah. when you know what it means? So while you're on the phone, I got an email from someone, the Ashes to Ash email. Okay. And it's a Kendrick Johnson case file and it's 300 pages. Wow, I wonder if it's like the, the full police file. Yeah, so it looks like the police file, which is nice because we were on our list of things to do is to fill out the Freedom of Information Act and which was made me nervous because the case was open and I didn't know if we I was like wow we just missed the window because what it reopened six days ago yeah so I was like oh my god will we be able to get the full report now because obviously we didn't think it was gonna reopen or reopen that fast I love this because <laughs> this was one of my big fears so that saved us some work so we need to ask this person who they are because it doesn't seem like they give us a lot of details here yeah. Maybe maybe we've got a friend out there. <laughs> Looks like it. Yeah. I'm I'm wondering though, just because of the depth of this case, like if that is everything, you know, or if it's just like the most important stuff. Right. So I just want to break into the episode really quickly. If you're watching for the first time because you're interested in the Kendrick Johnson series, please understand we have two other series that are out right now, and one is about 13-year-old Robert B, who was murdered in Pekin, Illinois. And also Carolyn Blankenfeld, a mother of four who passed away in 2018. So both of those series are ongoing currently. So please go and watch those if you're interested in the show. Also, just so you know, you can subscribe. And if you do subscribe, you get to see these episodes commercial free. You also get early access to them. You'll get to see uncut footage and you'll get to be part of our private Facebook subscriber group, which allows you to have additional contact with us and kind of personal Q and A's. And then you also get discounts on merchandise. So if you want to subscribe, you just need to do that on the website. The show is always free because that's how we get in tips and solve these cases. So if you don't have the funds to subscribe, just keep watching. And if you have any tips, please let us know. And I also just want everyone to know who's watching for the first time that we do take tips in anonymously. So if you have a tip and you want to give it to us, but you don't want your name or face or any identifying markers used on the show, that's no problem. Please feel free to reach out or we'll definitely protect your identity. We're not interested in outing a source. So if you have information, please feel free to reach out and we would love to hear what you have to say, even if you are not interested in being on the show. And now back to the episode. Wow, it's like 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just realized that? Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be a good day. I think so. We were bright and early, woke up and headed to Sheriff Polk's office. So I'm excited. Same, I wonder if we're gonna find out anything that we don't know yet, which I'm hoping that we do. Yeah, I mean, he was very nice on the phone. I don't know if he's going to be able to give us lots of details about the case. It sounds like they're under a pretty strict gag order. So the fact that he's interviewing with us, I thought was super polite or nice of him to even tell us where they're at. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're, we're paving the road for that relationship. Also to meet with him down the road, if we find anything, I always like knowing whoever the main person is so that we can give information if we have any. Yeah, what's nice about Sheriff Polk is he has never not called back within 24 hours. And some of the other cases, I wait days and weeks or don't hear back at all, which I think is really startling sometimes. So it's just nice that right off the bat here that he is being really responsive. Probably makes Kendrick's family feel pretty good about him, hopefully. Yeah, yeah you wonder. I wonder, yeah. if that's actually a good question. I wonder maybe tomorrow when we interview Marcus, we can see, are they excited about the police in Valdosta or just feel like they're standing on other sides? Cause Obviously, Polk might not be in that mix. They might really like Polk, and they might not have liked some of the other stuff the Sheriff's Department did. Yeah. Or maybe they're like, oh, there's, he's part of the problem. 
So I love that we don't know that yet, and we get to ask today and tomorrow, Sheriff Polk today, and then Marcus Coleman, who's a spokesperson for the family, tomorrow. I'm actually Paul. I'm the sheriff of Lowndes County. I'm a native of Lowndes County. Been here all my life, 75 years. And was first elected sheriff in '92. Took office in January '93. Served 16 years. Kind of slowed down. Was chairman of the county commission for the next four. And um, I was not even in politics actually when the KJ situation happened in 2013. It was pretty rough on the community, and um, with a lot of those things went around, you know, rumors and different things, and. And I, lo I love Lyons County, I love the people, and um, I've always had a good relationship with you know, all facets of the community, African-American, Caucasian, whatever. And I felt like I need, and my health was better, and I came back into the sheriff's office. One of the things I promised the people of this county was that I would look thoroughly into the KJ case and give them my opinion. Lowndes County Sheriff Ashley Pock was not part of the original investigation, but will so, lead I mean, the new one. I made them a promise. I made the people of this county a promise. I'm pretty well known for keeping my promises. Federal government did release all their files to me. Um, of course, they came with a order that they, they were sealed. And um, I can't discuss any particulars in those files, but I'm taking their files, our files, any, any other criteria on the case. Going through it with a fine tooth comb, it's not going to be an easy process. I mean, yeah. there's 17 filing cabinet boxes. 14 of them are printed material, and the rest is, you know, disc and tower and things like that. Wow. Six to eight months progress, but, you know, at least. But um, I'm doing it myself with another person that was involved in the case and calling other people. And so uh, I will give an opinion when I see it, and I, I don't have a predisposed opinion what it is. You don't ever want to go into a case like that. So it's a promise I made, and I keep my promises, and I'm pretty well known for that. When you receive 17 boxes, is it overwhelming or? With it being DOJ and FBI, you know, and all, all the effort they put into it. I mean, there's thousands of hours and I, I would say millions of dollars probably invested. Um, I pretty well expected it. And of course, you know, a lot of it's actually, they have our files, they've had ours for years. And so part of it is our files, which I'm quite familiar with. Like I say, it's gonna be a tedious thing to do, but um, yeah. we're gonna look at every angle and, I actually plan to break the case down into segments when, when I do give an opinion to help people understand how we arrived at that opinion. It's very complex. Yeah, even us looking into stuff, we're already like so overwhelmed uh, on the outside. And there's so many people that have already had an opinion. I mean, it's, you're probably not going to change their opinion. I mean, you know, there's still people around here that think the world's flat. I mean, so, you know, you're not going to change people like that. But I'm going to put the truth out there, and the truth is what it is. And, if they just can't agree with the truth, I, I can't help that. Do you think that this case has weighed heavily on the community of Valdosta for this since it happened in 2013? I think it did for the first couple of years. I think it's not as on the front burner as it was. If some people want to keep it there. Um, you know, recently we had a situation where in the last three weeks, in fact, it was national news. Kendrick Johnson's family say they recently obtained a recording of someone who may be confessing to killing him. The 17 year old was found dead in a rolled up gym mat in his high school eight years ago. An autopsy ruled his death an accident, but his family has always believed he was killed. They turned over the 25 second recording to the sheriff earlier this week. Now quote, they're gonna catch me anyways. I should have never done this. I was young and stupid. Kendrick didn't deserve this, man. A couple of seconds go by, and he ends with a very tearful, they're going to catch me anyways. Somebody contacted the family and said they had a taped confession. Um, we're actually working that case. It's still active. I told Ms. Johnson and um, Marcus Coleman, who's a friend of theirs, that we met with them, and they, they gave us a tape. And, I told them, I said, you know, do not get your hopes up because there are cruel people out there and of course they paid for this tape. So it, it could very well be a hoax. We're, we're getting very close on doing something on that. We've got a couple more things that we need to tie some ends loose and we'll, we'll have a statement on that shortly. And that, that's a cruel thing to do to a mother to come up and say, well, you, you, we got this confession, we got this and that and the other, but there are cruel people out there now. I mean, it runs scams every day and doesn't bother them one bit. Like I say, you'll never have a finality to it, but put it out there piece by piece and explain when we do get through. 
what my opinion is of it. And I think over the years, I have my faults like all people, but nobody's ever accused me of lying. I just, that's life's too short for that. And um, I live by my word, I always have. And um, whatever the outcome is, I'm gonna say it. And, and that's my opinion, I'll stand by it. I'll stand by it in front of any news camera or anything else. Do you think, um, I know you weren't the sheriff when KJ died there, but do you think the investigation at that point was handled well and the way it should have been? I think the sheriff's office, the people that in the field handled it, most of them worked for me, were trained under me. There was several things said about, you know, they didn't wear shoe protection, things like that. That didn't have anything to do with this case. It wasn't a bomb situation where there were fragments around, things like that. And I actually had calls since I was the former sheriff and one of them said, well, there was blood in the gym. Well, if you ever play basketball, a three-day-old gym will have blood in it. I mean, those samples were taken, and I think the amount of time it took the autopsy back. In fact, I was, like I said, I was chairman of the county commission, and I had a good relationship with the um, GBI, and I called the director of the GBI, and actually, and of course, the family and the lawyers heard me make the phone call. Told them, would they please go ahead and get the autopsy down, the initial autopsy, and of course it came in three days. That's part of a sheriff's job is to push things through. And and I think there were some places where the media didn't have full access, and I've always been full access to the media. Has anybody else interviewed you about Kendrick? Negative. Only person I spoke to was a detective. Sometime after it happened, but that was the only person I spoke with. Can you describe the conversation? Was it like a five minute conversation? They bring you in the station and ask you your no, experience? No, they or? came to the fire department. They just came in and just asked me what I remember about the scene and about the call. It was pretty brief. It wasn't too in detail. The day you guys got the call about Kendrick, do you remember how the call came in or how did how do you guys work calls right. like that? Well, at that department, when a call comes in, as someone in cardiac arrest, it's a cold blue. So a call come in as a cold blue, you're like, okay, then they give the location there, but the jaw kind of dropped because you knew the address was for the high school. So you're like, dang, I hope it's not a kid. Right. And then, of course, you know, everybody's nervous. You try, because I, I was driving that day, and you drive over there, because we were pretty close, because our station is maybe less than a mile down the road. Okay. So we get there, everybody hop out, everybody get the bags and go in, and since I'm the driver, I position the truck, so I move the truck out of the way to make sure the ambulance has good access to them, so I'm not blocking their way. So we get, I get inside, and Everybody's kind of just sitting there. I'm like, dang, why is nobody working them? Say my name and remember what you've done. Your hurricane has blackened out the sun. Play your game in a tangled web you spun. Send your rain while water fills my lungs.